Welcome to the biology section of our practice MCAT questions. In this video, we're going to be going through questions 51 to 55. So first I'll show you guys the questions so that you can pause the video and attempt them on your own. Here's question 51, 52, 53, 54, and 55. Now let's go through the questions together. In question 51, it says gram staining is a common technical, sorry, common technique utilized for classification of bacteria. Gram positive bacteria when stained appear purple under the microscope, while gram negative bacteria do not. This provides a simple method to organize bacteria. The difference between gram positive and negative bacteria is that what? So we are told that we can use a gram staining technique to, so a gram staining technique to classify bacteria and then gram positive are purple under a microscope, gram negative, they do not appear purple. And so what is the main difference between them for appearing different colors? Well, from your studies in biology, you should know that the way in which we stain bacteria is by putting them, immersing them in a dye, which should get stuck to a part of their cell wall called the peptidoglycan. So we're looking for that type of answer. We'll come across it. Option A is saying gram positive and gram negative bacteria differ in receptor molecules on the cell on the cell membrane. And it's saying like positive bacteria have receptors that induce the translation of a purple gene. No, because that's not what staining is. Staining is ex exposing something to a dye and hoping that that dye sticks. And we hope that it sticks to a certain part of the cell membrane, but it's not a specific receptor that it binds to and then we induce production of a certain type of gene. No, that's not correct. Option B is saying the bacteria have different thicknesses of the peptidoglycan cell wall. Yeah, that's correct. So peptidoglycan cell wall is a key term here. That is correct. And then it's saying gram positive bacteria have a thicker cell wall. Thus, the stain does not leave the cell once it has entered and reacted with the iodine solution. So this makes sense, right? We're told in the question stem that gram positive bacteria appear purple. And the answer is saying that in this thicker wall, the stain gets stuck in gram-positive bacteria. That's why they still appear purple, whereas it gets, it gets washed out with gram-negative bacteria and they don't appear purple. They appear a different color. They, they appear pink. So that all makes sense and it is the correct answer and it makes sense that we're looking for something sticking to a part of the cell wall. Option C is saying the bacteria have different hydrolytic enzymes that digest the stain molecules. No. There are not enzymes that, you know, digest the stain molecule. Once again, if you know your understanding of bacterial staining, then you should know that it's about sticking to a certain part of the cell, cell wall. And finally, option D is saying gram-positive bacteria possess a cell wall while the other does not. No, they both possess a cell wall. It's just the thickness of that differs, the amount of peptidoglycan. So B is the correct answer here. Now in question 52, it says... Ergosterol is a steroid compound found in, found in fungi which serves a similar function to cholesterol in animal cells. Ergosterol is often detected in samples of various grasses. Which of the following experiments would best identify whether ergosterol is produced by the plants or is a contaminant in the plant samples? So the first part is not really even that important. It just introduces ergosterol which is detected in samples of grasses, we want to know if it's produced by the plants or is a contaminant. So how do we figure out if a certain thing is produced by whatever species we have a sample of or if it's a contaminant in the sample? So option A is saying, if we want to compare ergosterol levels in fungus contaminated seeds versus fresh seeds with no visible contamination, no, that's definitely not the best way to do it. You're, if you're looking for a place which has like no, if you're looking for a sample which has no visible contamination, that's definitely not a scientifically sound experiment because even if it's not visible, it's possible that there could be a very microscopic level of like contamination of your sample and that's detected later on when you do testing. So that is not something which you, you should rely on, just using visual cues to see if something's contaminated or not. That's incorrect. Option B is saying, we should harvest seeds at various time points throughout the season and measure changes in ergosterol over time. This is talking about changes in the amount of ergosterol that we get over time. 
but that's not answering the question. We want to know the source of where that ergosterol comes from. This is kind of assuming that it is coming from the plants and that it changes over time due to the seasonal changes in the plants. So it's not answering the question. Option C is saying we want to transform fungal ergosterol producing genes into plants and compare their ergosterol levels to the levels of unmodified plants. No, this is not a good way either because now you're introducing a gene specifically which you know will produce ergosterol into these plants and it doesn't answer our fundamental question which is in the first place is it coming from these plants or is it coming from a different source and if you're you know definitely making sure that it comes from the plants you're manipulating this factor in a certain way that well it'll bias your reaction you want to just on your own observational in some own observational way figure out what the actual source was without you introducing any genes or anything and finally, option D is saying, if we supply plants with amphotericin B, which is an antifungal, which targets ergosterol in membranes, yes, this one would work. We give plants this antifungal, and it'll target ergosterol in membranes. And then we see if we start taking these samples of the plants, and because of specifically this antifungal, which is reducing the reducing any ergosterol produced by plants we'll see if if we give this to plants and no ergosterol is found in the in the samples at all that must mean that we're not seeing ergosterol because the plants are not are not no longer able to produce it properly that's why it must have been coming from them and that's why we don't see it anymore otherwise if we still see it in the samples that we collect then that means that we know that it's not coming from the plants for sure so it must be coming from some other source so we can at least narrow down that it's not coming from the plants so that would be a sound experiment that we could do to see if the plants are the source of this ergosterol, so that makes sense. Option D is the correct answer here. In question 53, it says viruses can be ruled out as a causative agent of a disease if the pathogen lacks which of the following. So we want to, we, if we have a disease and we're seeing what source is, we're seeing, we're, we will say that it will not be a virus, so we can rule out viruses if something is lacking. So if this thing is lacking, then that means it's not a virus because viruses certainly have this, this component. So option A is saying nucleic acid, and that is actually our correct answer. So viruses definitely have proteins and some type of nucleic acid. So if we see that there is a disease and no nucleic acid is present, then we can rule out the fact that it would be a virus because you definitely do need to have nucleic acid present for a virus to be present. So viruses definitely do contain this. If this is not found, it's unlikely that it's a virus. Option B is saying a phospholipid bilayer. This isn't a good answer because some viruses do have this, this bilayer and others do not. And so since all of them can't, since all of them do not have it, we can't rule out viruses completely because even if a phospholipid bilayer isn't present, then it's possible that it's a certain type of virus which doesn't contain a phospholipid bilayer, so it could still be a virus, so we can't rule out viruses. Option C is saying glycosylated proteins. Viruses should have nucleic acids and proteins, but they don't necessarily have to be glycosylated. So just like with the bilayer, they may or may not be glycosylated, and just because they're not doesn't mean we can rule out viruses. And finally, membrane-bound organelles is not even something that viruses have. So if we don't see those, it doesn't make sense to rule out viruses as a causative agent. Only A makes sense. In question 54, it says neutropenia is a condition characterized by abnormally low levels of neutrophils, which constitute the majority of white blood cells in the body. This can have adverse effects on the immune system and leave patients prone to infection. Which of the following would not be expected to cause neutropenia? So we're told that neutropenia means that we have low levels of white blood cells. And then this is kind of irrelevant, this sentence. And we're asked which one would not cause neutropenia. So three of these options will cause low white blood cell counts, but one of them will not. Option A is saying chemical damage to the bone marrow. We can rule out that option because damage to the bone marrow would lead to low white blood cell levels because the bone marrow is where we get the production of red blood cells and white blood cells. So if this site of production is affected, then we would expect low levels of white blood cells. Option B is saying autoimmune neutrophil targeting. 
So if the body's own immune system is targeting neutrophils for being attacked and destroyed, yes, that would also lead to low white blood cell levels in the body. So that can also contribute to neutropenia. Option C is saying, if you had an abundance of hematopoic stem cells, this one would not be expected to cause neutropenia because hematopoietic stem cells, they can differentiate, they're multipotent, they can differentiate into both the red blood cell and the white blood cell lineages. So they can differentiate into a, mul a multitude of different types of cells. And since they do specifically differentiate into white blood cells, if we had a lot of these, we would not expect to have a low white blood cell content in the blood or the body. We would expect to have an, a lot of white blood cells if we have a lot of the progenitor cells for white blood cells. So C doesn't make sense. So therefore it's the correct answer here. And finally, radiation exposure. Yes, radiation would lead to you know, cell damage and decreased amounts of rapidly dividing cells, such as white blood cells. So that's something which would not cause neutropenia. Now in question 55, we're asked, which of the following germ layers gives rise to the spinal cord? So which germ layer leads to the spinal cord? Option A is correct. The ectoderm is responsible for the central nervous system. So that is correct. The ectoderm does lead to the spinal cord. The mesoderm, it leads to things like skeletal muscle and the heart. So that is not correct. The endoderm is responsible for the majority of your organs. So that's not correct either. And the intraderm, that is a made up germ layer. So that is not a correct answer either. So A is correct. That's it for the questions in this video. If you enjoyed what you saw, make sure to check out our course. The link is in the description below. In that course, we go through the same thing as we saw in this video, a lot of different questions and going through all the different answer options and breaking down the logic behind which ones you should choose and which ones you should eliminate, which helps you on the MCAT. Other than that, make sure to subscribe to this channel to stay up to date on the videos that we post here. That's it for this video.